Siegel Theater Center in New York, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, it's a, a beautiful day, actually. It's cold, but the sun is shining and the sky is blue. And I think the reason is uh, because we are getting together today on this, as we say, planetary event to, to, to celebrate and to hear from um, the Siegel Center award winners of the civic engagement in the arts. Um, uh, if anything we have learned in the last year is that we have to uh, listen better, that we have to forge connections and we have to leave traces. We have to go beyond what we have done before and we have to reinvent uh, what, we, what we do. And with us, we have um, um, great theater artists, great artists, great human beings also, um, who have made a contribution that we think is extraordinary. Like everyone, we did over uh, um, 200 talks with 300 artists and everybody, one of them could be with us. But we thought these uh, projects speak for, for many, many others. And it's a great, great, great honor uh, for us to um, have these uh, uh, shining, brilliant people um, with us today. But what we really want to know is, you know, um, what they were thinking when they created the project, what impact did it have um, on their work and what are they working uh, on now? The Siegel Awards had been established to, to really uh, support um, New York uh, artists or people who support the arts and who think beyond their very own small uh, black box theater. And, um, but we thought in this time of Corona and in this uh, global planetary uh, crisis, which we are in, um, we have to look beyond our borders and learn and listen. And these people found something and I think we should listen um, 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 to it. So with us uh, is uh, Tanvi Shah from uh, India. There is Pamela Villoresi from Palermo, Italy, Hope Seda from Rwanda, and Catania here from New York City, Milo Rao from in, in Ghent, but from Switzerland, Gris Myers here in New York City, Thomas Oberander in Berlin, Eileen Banken and Kasia Wojcik, if I say that right, uh, in Ghent, also Belgium, Abhishek Majumda in uh, India, uh, Laszlo Upo from uh, uh, Hungary, and uh, we are connecting to uh, two more, Kirill Serebrenikov, the great Russian director, will join us, and also Emmanuel de Massy Motin from the Théâtre de la Ville. So welcome, everybody. It's a great day for us for the Siegel Center. We are very proud. It's maybe the biggest event of the year for us, and it's still at the very, very beginning. Um, so um, I would like to start maybe with Hope. Um, uh, where are you? What time is it? And Tell us a little bit about your project. Um, what has it changed? What has it changed in your work? And uh, what are you working on now? Okay, so my, um, I'm seated right here in the capital of Rwanda, Kigali. And it's 7 p.m., three minutes past 7 p.m. And uh, yeah, the project for me, it was a great challenge because for me, it was just listening and following the inner child within and just throwing a stone in the sea and then it had ripple effects. So I had no idea that it was going to build a very wide community globally. So for me, that was one really big um, uh, big impact it had. We, the, our community became bigger and um, it has now really, it, it is helping us, you know, move on to the next phase of after Corona because if you had, if you had paused for two years and then you wake up to start to be really hard. So for me, the project is like a bridge from before Corona, before COVID-19 to post COVID-19 because uh, it, it, otherwise, it mean, if pausing for two years would have really been very, very hard. So for me, the impact right now that I feel like is um, we have to embrace the hybrid format because we cannot abandon our online audience. So we have the physical audience and then we have an online audience. So every event you are going to be doing has to embrace both audiences because we love them both. So we need to like start, you know, start, you know, catering for both and, you know, focusing on these two different communities. So which when you merge them becomes one global beautiful yeah. community. And it's so a what great I'm work you did. Right yeah, and it's a great yeah, work so. you did with the Ubuntu Arts Festival, also daily programming over months, um, reaching out so to hundreds great. of artists. It is just, um, I, I think it was more extraordinary. More Hope, if it's okay. Countries, we, we're gonna go um, uh, to um, our next uh, speaker. So maybe uh, Laszlo, um, tell us a little bit about uh, the students and faculty of the Free SCFE Society in Budapest. Thank you very much. And strangely enough, we are in Rwanda time. So it's 7 p.m. in Hungary, although we are very, very uh, far away. Um, 
the, uh, the University of Theater and Film was attacked by the government, uh, forced uh, transformation, and the faculty and the students put up a fight. Um, eventually, the, the faculty members resigned and occupied the buildings of the university and kept it under blockade. And they created wonderful, wonderful uh, events. And it's become, it had become a huge movement followed and supported by, by uh, a lot of Hungarian civilians, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, uh, about half of the, the faculty and, the, uh, and the, uh, the students left the, uh, the institution and we formed a, a free society. And with the help of European um, uh, universities, now we created this program we call Emergency Exit. So the old teachers could go on uh, teaching the, the old students and got, uh, the students will get their diplomas in European cities. In Europe, at European uh, universities, and I think this really is a unique kind of, uh, yeah. you know, example of collaboration between uh, several countries and several institutions. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very grateful we mm -hmm. we got so far. Although I I hate the the original events, but but I'm very proud of the the outcome of this whole thing. Yeah, and as a reminder, they did the occupation in the time of the second wave. There was no that, vaccination. Yeah, that they coin, put their life on risk. With... Yeah, and it was the biggest civil rights movement against uh, Orban and his regime in Hungary, and it started at a theater university. So I think that is uh, truly um, uh, uh, extraordinary. So um, let's move to India. Abhishek and Tanvi, um, tell us a little bit about your project. What impact did it have and where are you now? Maybe um, Abhishek, we start with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm actually right now not in India. Right now I'm in Abu Dhabi uh, in the UAE because uh, I teach here at the New York University and we start classes day after. Um, so right now what's really on my mind is how to get started again online since we had moved offline last week, uh, last semester. So there's, I think as an as a teacher, there's always this crisis of you know, by the time you figure out online, you go back offline. Mm -hmm. And by the time you figure that out, you are online. As far as the project is concerned that you're referring to, well, I I suppose uh, our project, my project in Bangalore and Tanvi's in Bombay was really about survival. Uh, it, was, it was about how will people eat? How will they have oxygen? Uh, it was that kind of very fundamental uh, stuff, uh, but very important at that stage. Uh, I think it has it has moved in many ways by now uh, because we don't have that immediate crisis, but the crisis itself has opened up to uh, you know the, the enormous inequalities that exist around us and for us to recognize um, that these inequalities can surface uh, in our society at any point of time. Like it's this it's wafer thin, the layer that is guarding us. Um, and I suppose that's what, you know, the role of our art is as well. It is to keep prodding that mm -hmm. false security of a society. And, and just to, to, to let people know, Abhishek and his team for months stayed at night after night after a day's work, called people in rural villages who had no internet, who had no access. They bought old oxygen machines, repaired them, put them together, secured um, I remember one evening he said, I have to bring out some food. I have 2000 people on my list. I don't even know where to go. And I said, when I hang up with you, I have over a hundred people. Our team will have to call a team actually, theater people, but also others, but he was a key organizer. So this is a sensational next to his great work. Tanvi, tell us a little bit um, about the, the how round um, um, and um, what, if it had an impact and if there were um, um, results coming out of that. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so the Howl Round for India was a 24 hour uh, long theater marathon. Uh, a lot of people on this call who were part of that were speakers in it. Uh, there were 105 speakers from 31 countries who engaged in a 24 hour uh, constant conversation to speak about their personal and political experiences of the pandemic. And this, and I was roped into this project by Abhishek. Um, 
as a sort of extension of our of our relief work and to um, recognize the the work that theatre makers had put in um, as caregivers, as fundraiser campaigners, as relief workers, as dissenters, and of course as artists um, through the pandemic. Um, it was a rousing 24 hours. We, we were surrounded by anthropologists and, and folk artists and scholars uh, and people's poets who were speaking truth to power and politicizing the pandemic. Um, and I and the idea behind this 24 hour conversation and the magnitude of it was to uh, pay tribute to the relief workers and the healthcare workers who were who were staying up nights um, and days mm -hmm. and working for the community. Yeah. So it was, it was fact, amazing. Yeah, it was a great event and uh, um, I was lucky to be part of it. Let's move on to Chris. We have Chris Myers here. He's actually from New York City and, and Chris, our, our representatives here from the US, uh, when um, everybody uh, couldn't go out work and rehearse and uh, uh, act, um, Chris Meyer, who's a very successful, great actor here in New York City, OB award winner for Brendan Jacob Jenkins' play of Jerome, which we actually held the very first reading once at our Siegel Center. He did something unusual. He created uh, an online class um, uh, and is about anti-capitalism for artists and uh, and developed a five week schedule um, and ran that. So he thought we have to read, study, and prepare. Chris, uh, what impact did it have? Uh, yeah, I mean the impacts are still being um, rendered visible. I think the everything started because I think artists, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, were called to conversations around the importance of feminism and anti-racism, environmental justice, et cetera. But I found that a class analysis was missing. And I think that without a class analysis, we can't achieve any type, kind of true sustaining equitability with all these issues. And so I kind of, it honestly started with just putting an Instagram post out and saying, hey, does anybody want to study? And about 40 people took me up on it. And it was actually an eight week course at the time that I've since done five times over, personally taught maybe 150 people. But the real joy has been kind of people graduating almost from that curriculum and deciding to facilitate themselves. So now there's a facilitator core of four of us. Um, other people have added additional offerings. We have one coming up exploring the intersection of capitalism and mental health. We've got one on kind of creating a, what's called the solidarity economy in arts. Um, and it just continues to grow. I think the most magnificent thing is seeing people take this knowledge and go on and get more embedded in their unions, because although it is a political education course, it really is, I, I stress from the beginning, it's it, the point of this is to do something. You know, it's a it's difference between having a politics and doing something about it. So to watch artists go and they go into their unions or they go and kind of rejuvenate their art, Claudia Jones said, a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. And so I think people take this and I'm not prescriptive. I don't tell people what to make or what to write, but they learn this lens by which they can then uh, be in the world differently and create art differently. And people continue to message me saying things have, have this course has changed their life, but really they've changed my life because this whole program is community led. People basically say, this is what I want. Or, you know, I give a feedback form at the end of the curriculum. And sometimes it's stuff that, you know, I have to examine and Fantastic. be better with myself. So yeah. it's all and also to mention, yeah, this was free donation based mm -hmm. was a grassroots movement. He created a, you know, a new school and, you know, of learning. And um, um, it is an extraordinary idea and a little bit also of Brecht's idea of a theater without an audience, Lehrstücke, you know, to mm -hmm. and you came together and you, you learned something. So this is uh, just fantastic. Now with us today, we have um, uh, Milo Rao, Eileen uh, Duncan, and Kasia Wojcik um, from um, the great uh, School of Resistance in uh, Belgium and in Ghent. Um, their work is uh, also very brilliant. Milo, um, maybe tell us a little bit and introduce to us your collaborators. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's so it's so wonderful to be here and to, to to listen to all of you. So I'm the founder of this uh, school of resistance, which started as a as an online debate format. By the way, together with HowlRound, so um, we are very much linked uh, to this. And uh, with me are the curators of the school, Eileen and and Kasha. And I think it's the best when you explain a bit what we did and where we will end next. Okay, um, hi, I'm Kasia calling from Berlin um, and my colleague Eileen in Belgium, uh, Ghent. And um, I think I will start Eileen and then as we work the last two years, um, connect and speak and see where this goes. Um, so the School of Resistance started in the wake of 
or at the beginning of the corona pandemic where there was a feeling of we need to do something this is um the world is in crisis and we need to gather knowledge to gather knowledge on resistant practices of activists academics philosophers but also engaged citizens and we created we were very thoroughly um for over a year online episodes on different topics um, ranging and, and I really like what you said also Chris all the topics that we started so feminism environmental justice um, but yeah we I think Elin we, we try to gather all the knowledge that is possible in this world and what was created afterwards where the pandemic changed we try to embed more hybrid dimensions into it so um, I will maybe speak about the weekend we created in Köln, Cologne, and the political mm -hmm. impact I think it had. And then Aline, maybe you want to tell us what, what, what are yeah, the plans for the project. And um, in Köln, we created a manifesto um, gathering different NGOs and initiatives um, to say that what is happening on the European borders, people dying, horrible human rights abuses, that this is not this, this can't go on, this has to end, and this is complete injustice. And um, we want to go on working with this idea that there, we, we are all global citizens and we all have human rights. And maybe Aline, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think what, I mean, I can only uh, agree with what Kasha said. Uh, and I also liked what you said, Frank, in the beginning, like, I think the project also started from this desire that we had or this importance to also teach ourselves in listening um, rather than only talking and uh, so I think that was also like one of the main starting points why we thought okay let's really set up a discourse where people um, can also yeah can share their ideas but can also really listen to all the knowledge that is already there. Um, as Kasha said we are indeed now evolving into a more hybrid format because of course we also felt we um, after organizing over 20 online debates, I think you also felt the urge to also do beyond something beyond that uh, and to go beyond the discourse. So that's uh, also, for instance, why we are organizing in March a big school of resistance in the city of Ghent, because I'm now calling from uh, from Ghent. Um, it will be together with a couple of NGO uh, organizations and Gentian initiatives, uh, and it will be focused on the regularization uh, crisis and issue, because I mean, as it is the case in uh, in, in Europe in general, but in Belgium we have a very big um, or a very urgent case uh, with the sans papier, the undocumented refugees that are now living in Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been striking for over a couple of months, but there is basically or very rarely or yeah, basically yeah. no reply from from uh, politics and, or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Eileen, everybody can join, right? People, once it's announced, you can yeah, power sure. out. I guess how round, you know, we we also we connect, we connected each other, um, so people can come join, look up. I also would like to point out um, the great project, the new gospel Milo did, the film uh, which also we showed um, his great achievement, uh, a film school for Mosul, um, that they really did a project there. Uh, they, um, a classical play, a Greek play, and they said it's not enough to come and go, let's leave something, let's help something to create it. A film school, which is, you know, um, now slowly growing, um, it is sensational, as is the project uh, to uh, sell tomatoes by the immigrants, by the people who were harassed by the locals to say, let's create a cooperative with people together, let's own what we do, find new ways of distribution. And uh, I think it is a sensational. Emilo, maybe a sentence uh, uh, to that. Why do you think that is so important? Why don't you just do a play, even however great it is? We, 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 isn't that already a great achievement? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we mentioned the word uh, or the name Brecht, and I think Brecht was the guy who said, okay, you don't have to describe the enterprise from the outside. You have to enter the enterprise. You have to own the enterprise, and you have to change the way how uh, artworks are produced and distributed. And I wanted to make work and the school of resistance is an example of course the new gospel is another one or the film school in Mosul that we created together with the, the UNESCO the cultural branch of the United Nations uh, that you give the means of productions into the hands of the people that produce the project with you and that's how an art project can become a starting point or even an alibi to give these means to somebody else and then continues makes different films 
but owns the way of, of distributions. So that's, that's what I understand uh, of, of, of sustainable work, that you, it doesn't end with a premiere. We are not interested in, uh, in premieres. We want that there is an ongoing new institution that liberate, li liberates the people yeah. that uh, was part of a project. Yeah, I, I, I do think this is quite a radical project. I and mean, as was the project in Berlin, we had Thomas Oberender with us um, down to earth. Uh, it was, as they called it, an unplugged exhibition, daily programming with also, as Milo often said, agents of change. They said experts of change. Um, it was done with uh, artists, philosophers, activists, and without electricity, without flights, the idea was uh, to do something new and to try out uh, maybe what we all are asking for. Thomas, tell us a little bit uh, about the project and also what impact did it have? Thank you, Frank. Um, not sure what uh, about the impact. I think uh, the impact is um, that we start to see our own institution with different eyes, made uh, encounters inside of our institution we didn't have before. Uh, in de, de, Yes, we, we um, explored infrastructures uh, who are hidden usually, and now suddenly we, we met uh, our colleagues who are experts for that. And uh, so it's a it's in a way a project of uh, democratization of an institution. Um, uh, it means that everybody is important and uh, all the technicians, all the people uh, usually you don't see in their work time are very important. And um, this is a huge impact uh, from inside. From outside it's, uh, you know, the, the idea of the project was um, uh, don't um, make another um, exposition about uh, sustainability and climate change. Do everything in your institutional work to um, change the situation uh, that we can control. And this is how we exhibit, uh, how we work with the audience, with the artists, uh, with the experts. Uh, change that, change the operating system of the institution itself. So this could be the beginning and then we can go and invite people who are more experienced uh, in this field than we are. So um, every exhibition or every performance is means you create um, a public sphere. And what we did is we invited various kinds of um, communities uh, to come together Usually they don't meet uh, and they don't come together in institutions like a museum. But what we did is we opened up the museum as a place for various communities and we did it as a team. Uh, so it was from the beginning on very uh, much the work of a group of people. Uh, Tino Segal was very important for that, uh, but also uh, Julia Strauss and uh, Anja Predijk and uh, Stephanie uh, Rosenthal, who runs as an artistic director at the museum. So it was from the beginning um, a project of inclusion. Uh, so this yeah. was, I think, very important. Important. And also to remind the idea, I think, if I remember right, uh, on your work with Bruno Latour and Frederic Aitui, you said, how can you show an exhibition? on uh, climate change, but you have air conditioning running and uh, you know all the machines and saying, if you don't change as an institution or you don't even try to try out, how can you ask every, anybody else? So, um, and they really um, did that. And I think very successful. It's a great inspiration. Maybe we will think uh, you know, to do something here. I just saw that uh, the uh, Emmanuel uh, de Marcimota joined us from Paris, from the uh, great Théâtre de la Ville. Uh, it's one of the great, if not least leading public theater um, in, in France, or certainly also in, in Paris. And um, Emmanuel created a project, the Consultations uh, Poétiques. Uh, over the phone, uh, uh, actors were paid, luckily, uh, but they couldn't work. Um, and instead of closing things down, like many, many big US institutions did, they said, you know, why don't we come up with an idea? And one of the ideas was, you know, you could call in, uh, call an actor, an actor would call you back, talk about your life, if I understand right. And they would prescribe a poem for you, read it for you on a second call, and then also send it to you. Emmanuel, tell us a little bit about the project. What, and what impact did it have 
uh, uh, it's so unique. Twenty five thousand people, I think, uh, in, in, on ind as individuals participated. Tell us a little bit about the project and what it stands for in your theater. Okay, hello, Frank. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm in Paris with the team of Théâtre La Ville. For for myself, this project has allowed me to to move from an idea of solidarity and. Uh, commitment of the theater to an action shared by a greater number today. This project brings together more than 200 uh, people in France and in several, several countries now of the world. And the number continues to increase. And it's uh, very strong for me and for the people who are working with this project, because this project goes beyond my own commitment and my personal project it meets the the co commitment of other people and other structures i i don't build it only with a, a team of my own a new way perhaps to, of doing for us today um, a more inclusive method and for the institution in france in europe uh, this project has made it possible to develop a capacity to work in a net a new network a network that it's built day by day uh, uh, with this idea of the relation uh, of solidarity between us which requires adapting our practice and working with flexibility a new flexibility for for us not to reproduce what we already know how to do, acquire a capacity for immediate innovation based on a principle of humanity. This project therefore makes it possible to humanize our relation with the institution, with the Théâtre La Ville and others, big institutions in France, in Europe, and in other countries. Yeah. I also because understand you have, you have a strong African collaboration, Asian collaboration, so it was not just a French um, um, no, um, yes. a project. Uh, tell yes. us also a little bit about your arts and science. I I found that also uh, extraordinary. What you uh, what you are uh, interested in, what you promote. Yes, the, this this moment of the pandemic, it's perhaps a way, and I don't know if we can say an opportunity for the us and. The, the science and with the hospitals and with a lot of people who are working in the hospitals to try to transform and renew, renew it, itself. And we work with uh, uh, more than 20 hospitals in this moment uh, with more than uh, 30 actors uh, yesterday who are working in different hospitals to try to create a new relation between the science and the art, to try to create a new dialogue and not the project for the culture, the culture only uh, with the people, but uh, how we can think for this new century, the relation be between the science and the a new mind try to advance and the new imaginations in the science, not only the imaginations in the arts, but uh, on the science too. And uh, this new relation is very strong. We are working this moment uh, for with the, the, the actors and not only the actors, with the doctors, uh, no, neuroscientists and uh, uh, a lot of uh, different hospitals to, to try to work uh, uh, a new play uh, and to work together about uh, how we can build a new culture of the medicine and not yeah. only to change. And we need to change our culture of medicine um, for us because we, we discover something very strong and not only in France. And when you, you say, Frank, we are working in the, with the, the African continent, we worked now with seven, uh, uh, no, 11 countries, different 11 countries, countries, 11 countries. And this start just one year ago. And yeah. uh, we are building something very strong for for her, for them, and not we are not thinking how we can help. Not yeah. only that we are no. we, we need to think how we can learn something how to new. For, and and to learn something new, we need a new relation, and to take time with the other. 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, that what I also found very impressive that you said it's an open theater, people can connect, uh, people can come to you, participate. So um, I think uh, all models we heard now, I think are really something different, something new that is emerging. It's a continuation of a tradition, but uh, in a way it is uh, redefined. It's a contemporary interpretation of that great great form of theater. I always remember a colleague of mine talked about geo metamorphosis and he said once a crystal was pressed through the forces of the earth and they were inside a mountain but over a million years later the crystal disappeared and another fluid came in and then another one. So forms are there but they are filled with new uh, uh, creative ideas. Everybody uh, is with us. Kirill Serebrennikov has some problems connecting in from Russia. Ria from the great Paper Moon Theater Company cannot uh, join us. She gave birth yesterday. Um, Paper Moon did a fantastic uh, 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 a project they would, uh, for a very little fee, uh, get commissioned by friends of healthcare workers or family members. They create something for that person, so they would create a puppet theater, a puppet uh, 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 object uh, piece online and send it to the person as a gift for no money. They got some funders who helped them, but very, very little. They would send a uh, creative little boxes to people to create puppets, how to create uh, little stories. And um, so they um, also talked to hundreds of puppet artists. They had an online series like the Seagull Talk and they um, also continued their work. So it's, I thought it was extraordinary, um, the beauty of their work. The commitment also was very, very little fu uh, funding and there's no real um, cultural center to support. So thank you. Thank you all. It's a, a big, big honor to be with us. We also have with us Ed Catania, who we gave a lifetime award. She created something that was called the Lincoln Center Director's Lab. Uh, America is a, often looked at as a big island, and it is an island. It's big, but it is an island, often narrow with the tunnel vision. Uh, Tony Kushner said it's the uh, melting pot that never melted. And one of the very, very few uh, initiatives that really was global planetary, and was en and her works and retired from Lincoln Center this month. She's just packing these days her bags and books, and it was an extraordinary uh, work. And did did your work have an impact on Lincoln Center, on the city, on the world? What happened? Well, thank you for for <laughs> having me be part of this conversation. I mean. It's absolutely amazing to hear what everybody's doing. And there's absolutely no question that it's, I think, world changing. I mean, listening to the people you've gathered, Frank, and you're, you just have your nose to the ground, you know who's doing what. I, I just, I wanted to say really that, that I'm, I'm in New York City. Um, it's been bad everywhere. Uh, but it was really bad here. I've been in this apartment for almost two years. Uh, 33,000 people died in within 50 blocks of my apartment when the when the uh, when the infection started. So it's just been a kind of purgation in some regards. The theater is destroyed. It's tried to come back. It isn't coming back. Right now, it will, of course. The theater always comes back. But at the moment, we're still lockdown and most of the performances, people are trying, but most of the mm -hmm. performances are canceled. But I have come to actually agree with what Emmanuel said, which is as horrible as this time has been in every way, not just, not just uh, the, of course, uh, COVID, but it's, it, you know, politics and the environment. And you know, it's been such a time of change it's sort of like the plague you know changing the world back in in the 15th century that that in a way i think what you all here today are doing um is an example of the kind of thing that would never have happened had we not gone through this absolutely terrible time and and what that means is not only are you and i'll talk about this in just a sec because it's just giving me these ideas listening to you you know, essentially great theater artists, you know how to, how to work in the theater in very different ways, but also it's expanded your reach into the internet, into new forms of, of uh, online communication, which is something we didn't do. We didn't know about five years ago, even, or 10 years, and we knew about it, but we didn't use it. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel that 
the power of what we have is in real time, is in the presence, is, in, is with people together. And, and when I look at what you all have done and you know, can start with Hope who, who, who was, yeah. who came to- It's, a, it's extraordinary assembly yeah. of people. It just just to tell everybody, Anne is also the premier dramaturg, one could say, of America. That's what she's known for. Over 1500 directors, young emerging directors from over 50 countries came to her director's lab in 25 years. She built a network um, that uh, go around. So it is, you know, an extraordinary um, um, achievement. And I think her work also stands for everything. I'm sorry, Emily, I would like to ask a big question. Wait, wait, and can it, I just, yeah, can I just, yes. One other thing. So, so when I met Hope, I mean, without even breaking a sweat, she tells me she's working with 3000 people. I mean, it, it's absolutely unbelievable. But I just want to end by saying, yeah. you know, the thing that we hear together sitting and looking at all your faces, no, we know how to do is to collaborate. And we know how to collaborate in a respectful, artistic and adventurous way. And that is not thing, a thing that most people in the world know how to do. They don't know how to do that in politics. They don't know how to do that in business. We know how to do that. That's how we approach the world. And that is what our gift is. And that's the reason that all the projects that you've been describing has worked. I don't think they knew how to do that in universities as well. Um, so it's sort of like that horrendous, horrendous uh, saying that Apple had when they started, you know, move fast and break things, mm -hmm. you know, move fast and break things, but retaining the spirit, I mean, it's not even the spirit, it's how we grew up. We were apprentices in theater. We know how to work with people, just like Shakespeare did, or just like- yeah. So this is, uh, the question is, um, um, and thank you, if we say we know how to do it, but um, to get back also on Milo's book project, he uh, collected voices from over 100 theater makers around the world and thinkers, philosophers, and the idea was uh, why theater? You know, the famous Lenin, quote, what to do, was to, you know, but why theater? Um, and I would like to ask everybody as an open discussion, you know, we don't want to have this uh, go on for too long, but, st uh, but, uh, but still to open discussion, um, our legal talk was about this why, you know, Brecht said we need new theater for new times we live in. What, what do we need now? What are you thinking about? What are your plans for the future? What do you think is of real importance? And I'll just um, open it up and, um, and uh, just speak whenever you can, but I hope everybody will say something. So um, to everybody also listening, and I know we have listeners from many countries, young artists, also established artists, you say, you know, what is of importance now? What is of significance what can we learn from, from you, as Emmanuel um, said? Whoever uh, wants, to, uh, wants to start. Chris, maybe I'll ask you. Uh, sure, uh, I think um, I, I'm really fascinated by people who are experimenting with new models of producing theater, of creating theater. I mean, I think right now, for instance, the theater industry is debilitated, but I think the theater is clearly alive, right? And I think a lot of that connotation of industry is, I think, because of how embedded capital is with theater makings. I don't, I can't speak to all the countries on this call, but in America, you know, we have our nonprofit structure, which is super problematic. And we have the commercial model, which is of course very problematic. And it's hard to make um, theater that speaks to people or experiments with new, not just content, but new forms. And so I'm really interested in a lot of what I do try to encourage with the people who take uh, the course is to think of what it would look like to make theater that is truly in community with, or rather in conversation uh, with communities instead of like boards and like people who are seeking profit, what would it look like? And I think it's a completely different um, way of making theater because we kind of assume that we do a, a play that matters and then we just put the advertisements out and it kind of, they come, you know, and there's whole scores of people who never make it into the theater with that model and we're not accountable to them. And they're the people I think that if we want to make progressive art, 
uh, really matter. So I think experimenting with new models of production and embedding art into communities is huge, but we have to listen. I think also that's another thing I'm learning a lot on this call is it's, a, it's shifting away from speaking at people to listening to people and having an actual dialogue. That's something that I've been doing this professionally for 12 years. I, I, I mean, I really don't think that most of the work I've done has been coming from a place of listening. It's just coming from a place of talking at people. I would like to say that we need for I need we need to use the creative power of theater and being in the International Institute of Political Murder for the last five years. I learned that theater is the tool, the utopian tool, but it's like a really like it's a tool where we can shape the world with. It's like we can take theater and say, this is real and it, it becomes real. And this is just the fun of it. And I think political movements need that or progressive political movements, because we also see theatricality being torn or taken by alt-right or fascist or like movements. But I'm saying, I think we have a lot to offer to political progressive movements because we have so much fun creating things. And it's, um, yeah, we can just create situations. It's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for me, I, I think uh, and just tapped on it. Uh, what I've learned is that really the idea of collaboration makes us stronger. We learn more in a very short time by just doing, like the Chinese proverb. So I think we need to pick up on that. How do we collaborate? We don't have to travel anymore to collaborate. And when people just work together, just you know, a random artist with another artist from Syria, and they're just tapping on one theme. It ends up affecting us all as humans, and I found that really we are together. We are we are human together, and through being humans, we create art, and art is about life. And for me, I think we can build our communities and give our communities hope by just you know creating a conversation through creating art together. So I think for me, the worry of I have to travel to China, I have to travel to wherever to create with somebody is that is out. Because uh, for me, I think what I really focused on last year was how do we as artists work together? And most, and in our online festival, it was more about collaborations than, you know, because that, that's what I was missing. Can we meet again? But if we can meet online and create work, when we meet physically, we still have a conversation what we are to work on. Yeah, so working together, collaborations for me is my take. I think collaboration and creation, you just had the, the the key words, uh, referring to, to our example, in Hungary, loads of institutions, loads of uh, parts of the society have been attacked by the government and destroyed by the government, but no uh, resistance like ours touched uh, so many people uh, because uh, the students, as I said, and of course with, with the faculty, we, uh, we created so many spectacular uh, uh, events all through Budapest and around the country. So we, we, uh, with the tools of theaters, we, we kind of woke up people all around. And if it wasn't for this attack, if it wasn't for the movement, we, have, we could have never uh, experienced the, the collaboration with those international institutions. And that was also via theater. Um, so uh, I, I firmly believe in, in the power of, of this kind of artistic co collaboration that touches the, the hearts of, of so many people. And watching you all around uh, the world and on my screen, uh, what I experience is there are you know, several endless ways of this kind of uh, creation and collaboration. I think one of uh, the aspects of our power is that there's no one way, there are several ways, millions of ways. Uh, this is giving me an idea. S someone should write something about how the arts and politics can inter uh, can work together to um, to increase their effect to good effect. Uh, I I know some of you know about this and some of you may not. But when we were doing Serafina and we had a lot of contact with South Africa, this is before. Mandela was released from Robben Island. There were a lot of theater people who were involved in his 
release and his assumption of power and how that was done from stage designers, I know, um, who created his inaugural stage to the great, and this is someone, Frank, you should definitely have on your, some podcast, the great Peter Dirk Ace, who is a big, powerful rugby player like guy who dresses as a woman named Evita Besudenhoit. And she came onto the stage with Nelson Mandela. And let's just say, this is like a guy society and said, oh, I am so in love with, with uh, De Klerk. He's so sexy, you know, and he diffused things through laughter using a great theater artist. Um, you, you know, you have to remember also that in a bad sense that, that a, a lot of the conflict in the Balkans started at a theater conference where, you know, like the Berlin, Ber, Berliner Festival where major productions from theaters are invited to perform. There's a, there was a similar festival and each entry was a kind of nationalistic presentation from a writer and that caused the beginnings of a lot of, you know, the wars. So there's a power there. It would be interesting to, 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 to write about examples of, of where that happened. I mean, you can make a case that Artaud, you know, writing at the same time as Brecht, you know, in the totally opposite direction, that the, that the end result of a great Artaud vision, which he was never able to realize, would be the Nuremberg r rallies, you know, a spectacle, nonverbal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a very interesting. I mean, he, of course, he would never have wanted yeah. it anyway, but, but it's, it's a very interesting. Uh, somebody needs to say this. Somebody needs to write yeah, this. I think this is the importance. We have to write things also down. Theater people have to write, also engage. I think this is something we in America often are a little bit uh, too cautious. But um, who else uh, um, has Pamela? I think that the pandemic was really an occasion to ask uh, uh, to ourselves uh, what is our duty, what the theater can do for the society, like in the ancient period of Grecia. Uh, you need the theater to, to have uh, interesting questions, to have some answers for the life. So um, during the lockdown, especially where we are, we are closed, so what is our duty? What, because the people, the society needs us. And so we, uh, we started, okay, we, we were the first in Italy to start to, to act uh, live our performances and, and to go online. But it's on, not only that. It, uh, we wanted to collect the voices, the thoughts of all the persons that were closed in the house, in the prison of the house, where the world were closed in the house. And uh, so through the professors and the schools, we received a hundred and hundred pages of uh, written by the students of all the area of Sicily. And uh, with all this material, we let our, the professor, drama professors and drama pupils of our theater school to work over this material. And then when the lockdown was finished, the first, we, uh, in, in summer, uh, we produced three shows about all this material, inspired from this material. Was, one was dedicated uh, to the second generations, especially in Palermo, we have a big Indian uh, group, in, Indian community, I mean Indian, especially from B Bangladesh. And uh, so we did a show the, called uh, Bengala Palermo, and then two other shows, uh, uh, Via Crudex, and one with Irina Brook that started to work with other, our pupils, uh, uh, actors from uh, London. And she started to work with them, then she came, and in September we did a show in a very beautiful yeah. museum yeah. that is, um, um, yeah. So, um, um, Pamela. So, if you say right, what would be to reach out? The word "school" actually often comes up. You reached out to schools. You listen to voices, and um, you 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 put it together. And from what was around you, and listen. I think Thomas had uh, his his hand up. Um, Thank you. Yes. Uh, just one idea um, about future of theater. 
uh, personally, I'm very interested to become I become more and more interested in positions beyond the human position, because we understand uh, the the drama, the strategy with Gaia and our, our whole uh, biosphere of the planet Earth uh, is because we humans think we are in the center of everything. And one of the models to teach us that we are the center of the world is the theater. Every conflict on Earth that is on stage is a conflict between humans. And so I think we can also use the theater to go one step beyond and uh, have different companions, different perspectives that are not only human perspective. So if we can manage to bring back the, the ghosts, uh, the animals, uh, the things, the objects uh, in a different way, we did have that before the modern time, uh, before Renaissance. And I think we have to go back and learn from the archaic epoch, uh, how we can more be sustainable, uh, not only in the way how we make theater, how we look on earth, on the planet. Uh, that's important and we can use theater also for this. This would be my wish and that's what I'm working about. Mm -hmm. Abhishek, what do you think? I think, you know, I think before the pandemic, I used to think often that when I would travel around the world, that we were all becoming court poets. You know, like we would all sort of get something and we were there was a model how you become successful in the theater is by becoming a court poet of something. You, you sit in a, a king's courtyard and you speak a certain language and then you become an important person and that, that was the kind of model uh, I, I felt. And I think it has shifted drastically into a lot of people recognizing that we have to be bank robbers and not court poets. You wear a mask, you go in, you have very limited time, you steal from the rich and you run and you scramble and give it to everybody who's around. Uh, to me, the most important thing that I've learned in the pandemic is to not be a court poet, but be a bank robber. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Emmanuel. Yes, I <laughs> very important points. I think for me and for us, it's how to change something with, not with the others, but with, with us, with me, how we can, how I can change and what I, I, I can change in me. Because the point, it's what the theater can do to the size, the society, but we can think on the same time, what the society can do to the theater, because I think it's the same point. Theater, theater is society and society is theater, and it's not a separation. And perhaps it's, if we think more how the relation with politics and art can work together, perhaps it's the same point. It's the question now to how to build a new, for me, a, a new uh, alliance between the medicine with, uh, uh, with the doctors, uh, with uh, the artists, with the education on the society. Uh, theater can do nothing alone. The, now the point is this new alliance uh, after this pandemic of artists, doctors, scientists, not only change our production modes in the theater, but we must connect with the frontliners such as doctors, medical staff, researchers. We must find a new imagination that connected uh, connects them uh, and it's not only us and the artist and the culture it's it's more global and now it's a new link for the 20 now 21 century with the new generation and it's how we can stop this separation between science art education no all could be connect now this is mm -hmm. the point for me Wow, that's uh, quite something. The School of Resistance, what, you have done an extensive research and it's an ongoing project. What have you learned and what, what do you think, what do we need to do? Maybe I can um, briefly add to that also to get back to this idea of why theater, I think for me is one of the main reasons 
is this idea of inclusion or importance of inclusion and representation. And I think that was something that we very strongly uh, had as our ambitions as a school of resistance, um, because of course, uh, theater is society, but is it like in its entirety? At that, I'm wondering, I don't know. Um, and I think that theater is just a very powerful tool as well to uh, enable certain people to get into the conversation on in the public debate that otherwise are often excluded from this. So I think theater in this way, because of this forced, this, this confronta confrontation, this forced physicality enables uh, to get the table uh, bigger, to get the conversation uh, more inclusive, more um, uh, surprising even maybe, um, because it also uh, makes it happen that we talk to people we otherwise wouldn't necessarily meet or to hear arguments we otherwise wouldn't necessarily hear that often. Um, and I think, and of course, it's 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 also a big uh, challenge because um, we are, especially like being a city theater, um, like who who is a city, who is a city we are doing it for, and are we already reaching enough to the all the citizens in Ghent? Uh, so it's it's both a strength I feel, but also uh, a challenge that we are daily uh, working on. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tan Tanvi. What what do you think as a young theater? artists in India, uh, with all the complications, the little funding, you know, what, what, what do we need to do? What inspires you? Um, at the end of 2019, I, I submitted my master's thesis, uh, which was on what is a director doing when they're not directing? Uh, what is a director's practice? And then four months later, the pandemic hit. Uh, so for the past two years really for me have been about nurturing artistic responses uh, within myself outside of the rehearsal room, uh, just my inquisitiveness, my curiosity and, uh, and my dissent and, and just a questioning mind. And I think conversations like this really reinstate that even when we have not made theater, um, we haven't stopped asking the questions that inform our theater. And, uh, and that's what I'm looking to keep doing uh, until I get back into the rehearsal room. And until then, I'm, I'm currently working as dramaturg on a few projects which are um, preoccupied with the dramaturgy of dissent um, mm -hmm. and the dramaturgy of discomfort. Yeah. And, and what, what is that? Uh, mm -hmm. What does that look like? And I've never, I've never um, thought about discomfort as much as I have these past two years. Uh, so I think it's really mm -hmm. interesting to think about it theatrically yeah. and, and find those words. And also dissent in India doesn't mean critics fighting of, of, uh, about yeah. what you write about a show. It means go to going to prison, you know. So, um, Milo. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, what, what uh, I can perhaps add to what Eileen said and what Kasha said about School of Resistance is that when you open this space that can be invaded by knowledge that was excluded from this space by what became possible with hybrid formats, then you see that, for example, the answer to how can we have a cosmology or a theater where the human is not the center, but there are ghosts and things, etc. you find out this knowledge is there somewhere on this planet. <laughs> and this is, for me, the main, I mean, kind of incredible impact of the last two years that I said, we were excluding so much. I was not meeting so many people and I don't know why. So I think that we kind of overcame, uh, I mean, now I'm, I'm, I'm going perhaps a bit too far, the myth of presence where we were a bit locked into theater. And then he said, okay, I can have a debate with all of you today on Saturday and later on together with my family, you know? And I had so many inspirations and that's a bit what I, 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 I found out. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last years. Yeah, yeah. And kind of a very intimate personal experience. On the other hand, is a global or planetary one. It is, um, it is stunning. Again, um, from the Siegel Center, we really would like to show all our respect to all of you and the work you have been doing and what you are doing. We know how hard it is to be an artist, how much uh, uh, it takes, and also to sustain it and to keep on working. And the project you created really, really um, moved things. You are agents of change. What you're doing is uh, the most important, we feel, we think. Um, these are the homeopathic pills in the body, you know, with have an effect. 
and it represents something, it stands for something. And uh, you don't just do something, you stand up for something. And I think that is uh, a big difference. And what everybody asks about experiments and new forms, you, you did it. I think um, this is models to look up to. And for everybody listening, please, this is just to inspire you also to do your own. If you're listening, um, this is not just uh, about congratulating. So that's why we're going to keep this ceremony short. It is about what can you do? What are your connections? How many people do you reach out to in your neighborhood? How, how much uh, uh, inclusion is there? Are you thinking about new forms in your life? And uh, what is the circle of your friends looking like? And um, But also um, go to the arts, support the arts and the artists. What they are doing is a visible change. And if it's real on stage, it can also be real in life. And I think this is what Abhishek once said in our discussions. He said, how come that all the TV shows and films in India go on and they can be critical? But if I do a little play in a little room where I criticize someone, I get censored and it gets forbidden. So it why do you ask me if, if it has an effect? It does, of course. So I think this, we should not underestimate that. And I think what you did, great project, brilliant project, and really all our, uh, um, our um, ad admiration, it's uh, you picked a little apples from the tree of, of knowledge, I think, and you shared it and you are continuing it. So for everybody, uh, Follow the work of all these great uh, theater artists. Perhaps you also could connect. That would, of course, make us happy. And as a closing sentence, maybe uh, for everyone, um, we have young young artists, emerging artists listening. If there's one thing you would say, you know, in a sentence or two, what would you say to the young artists? You know, like Rilke's famous letters to the young poets, but of course, a little bit shorter. Um, what do you say? Because it could be you listening to this when you were young and started out. What What do you say? And um, maybe I just go by by the screen and how it's in front of me, Thomas. Oh, I would say um, trust the belief that data are not our faith. Yeah, Tanvi. What do I say to young people? Uh, uh, Laszlo Upor actually in the 10th hour of, of HowlRound uh, uh, said that a pandemic is not a private matter. And I think that that really stayed with me because what I've gotten from the past few months and years has been this real sense of community. And uh, the theater community is extraordinary in in even with these distances and making mm -hmm. you feel like you belong so yeah thank you. Yeah. Pamela uh, yes i i would like to say that uh, to insist to stay in in the society uh, we want to continue to be the the voice of uh, young persons some students, the new generations, the heroes that are combating the, against the mafia, the voices of women, of everybody. Uh, but uh, I'm sure we have a lot of young persons, uh, um, uh, directors and drama writers that are giving us very good projects that are inside the society. We must continue to be the voice of the society. I think the theater, uh, th this occasion brings the theater out beyond the building of itself. And I think mm -hmm. we have to continue yeah. this way. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hope. Yeah, we are coming from a, a massive disruption and uncertainty of the last few years. Definitely a changed world uh, awaits us. Uh, it, it's full of threats, it's full of promises. And I think this is the time for us not to, to just sit, but to seize every opportunity and to create a future of our making. Because uh, if we wait for the world to make it for us, then we lose time. But I think this is the time for us to grab this opportunity, regardless of the threats it, uh, the situation has come up with. Mm -hmm. And. You, you're muted. Uh, Trying not to talk too much. Yeah. I just 
tortured myself for four years and wrote this book. And the conclusion that I came to was something that I knew when I started, so I saved myself the trouble. There's a great book published by, uh, edited by Todd London called An Ideal Theater. And he simply reprinted the founding statements of every theater from, I don't know, as far back as he could go. Stanislavski and, and Amirovich Danchenko were in it all the way up to, you know, the Teatro Campesino, I mean, it, it, Free Southern Theater, the Group Theater, everybody's in it, Federal Theater Project, and they're all the same. They're young people who usually spend a night in a bar, that's how the Moscow Art Theater was founded. They hate the theater that's around them. They find a, a, a degree of commun communality and, and they believe in what they are, want to do. They're unknown, they have no money. The group theater started in the middle of the depression in the United States when they would try and get a nickel together to stay warm in an automat, mm. a cup of coffee for four hours. And they made a theater together. They didn't get permission from a big theater. That's not the kind of thing the theaters can do. It has to be done by people who agree. And that is how it's always been. It's a really interesting book because you will mm -hmm. recognize the success that they all made in mm -hmm. some cases, very substantial. So I would direct everybody to that and say, thank you, do that. Milo. Yeah, sorry, I was a bit deconcentrated because Anne gave me in the chat beautiful ideas and names. So I had just to copy to not lose it when we close the Zoom session. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Um, so, <laughs> Um, for me, what can I say to young young uh, theater makers? I think really theater is a magical tool. Uh, the world has to be changed and uh, use it. And the second thing I, I learn again and again is that every play is the first one. And this bar that uh, Anne is describing, I have the impression every week again, you sit in this bar and you want to reinvent the theater with the people around. So it never stops. Mm -hmm. Chris. Yeah, what I would say to young theater artists is actually the same I'd say to all theater artists or all people, really. When I was a young person, I just read, I read older people talking to each other and listened to them. And I just took what I needed, which is, I would say, study and organize. Study, follow your passion, follow your interests unrelentingly. Don't wait for people to give you permission to learn something. I always tell people, read above your comprehension level. You'll get it later. And organize. Find community. Find people who not only completely agree with you, who will challenge you and make something, do something, figure it out through an iterative process and just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Kasha? Well, I still feel like a young emerging artist, but um, I want to say what I learned in the last five years is um, persistence, persistence. And I think um, this is also really important for our political fight to really stay, just stay and do it and be patient that things happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, I think it's a bit similar, Skasha. I'm I'm not I'm not so sure if I feel confident in giving like artistic advice as I'm only creating my own artistic um, practice at the moment. But what I'm reminding myself of uh, often is to to stay with the trouble, to be a dissident, and to to dare to be the killjoy. I think that's it. <laughs> Abhishek? I think, you know, uh, I would say to young theater makers that look at Tom and Jerry and see how we see them fighting all the time, but that's because none of them have a house. And there's a guy who is so big that in the entire series, we only see this person's feet. We never see their face. They're the big person who owns this house, but we always see Tom and Jerry. And part of the job that theater has is to imagine the face of this thing, this person who's actually responsible for this endless fight between Tom and Jerry and to make that face visible. I think that's one of the things that I feel the theater is about and worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Laszlo. Uh, yes, just like Chris, I think this is to everyone, not, not for only young artists. Uh, even if you're very proud of your 
creativity, uh, you should always remember that there's much more to imagination than your everyday practice or routine. You should open yourself up to the responsibility of collaboration, the beauty and the responsibility of collaboration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. You have the, the, the final word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you came uh, last. That's what happens. Okay, okay. Yes. I, I try. Yeah. I try perhaps to say just uh, how to try to, to respond with a new story, and but to know the story and to for the young people to have the memory of what you don't know. How not only your story, but the story of the humanity in you uh, and with the other. And to know the story, you, you need to work with you and with the others and try to find a new imag imagination. And how the theater, yes, can be out of the buildings on all the space and the new liberty for a new artist and create relations on the world with other language, not only your language. Now, uh, to try to understand, if you don't understand the language of another people, it's not a problem because you can feel something of the other. And it's not a problem when you don't understand. You can try a new way and how to work with yourself in this new challenge for diversity, gender, equality uh, for this planet. And how is your responsibility tomorrow? Yeah. Well, these are very, very, very profound statements. So really, really thank you. I think maybe we're gonna all type them up and send them out and uh, to, to our list. And I really would like to thank you all again for taking the time to come and join us to accepting the award. And uh, really, again, um, um, congratulations. Um, and what you did is of vital importance. It is of great importance. And uh, you all are part of the civilized world. And um, so um, this is um, has been a big honor hosting you. We didn't want to go over an hour. We even thought it would be shorter. So we're going to um, stop here. This could, of course, go on uh, much, much longer. And to everybody listening, thank you for taking the time. Um, also to listen, as everybody here said, it is important, but think about what it has meant for your practice, for your life, for your work, to collaborate, to listen, to read above what you normally think, and, um, and be inspired by that work that is real, and what these people, that is very real, and it, it is change. This is how change looks like. And uh, so thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, so many things are out there right now. When we started Siegel Talks, not so many conversations were online uh, in March, but um, um, now there are more. So it really means a lot that you, you took the time and we can only hope it was as meaningful for you as a listener, for you to participate us as it was now for me to listen. It's been a big honor to hosting you and please um, stay connected to everybody here um, and let us know what you are doing. And of course, we will be uh, following your work and hopefully find ways um, to collaborate all together. Thank you all. All the best and wishing you a great weekend. And let's all hope we have a safe year and that things are um, looking up and that we will find ways, you know, to get out of the buildings and to collaborate, to learn and to listen. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks.